before we get into this week's episode, I want to make a plug for Art Market Minute. This is Artnet News's new micro podcast hosted by Margaret Kerrigan, who's the site's news editor, Europe. It offers a weekly snapshot of essential art market news expertly compiled by the Artnet Pro editorial team. I never even thought about the fact that, well, maybe you, your art can be something that is not just representative or symbolic, but it can actually be like a real thing. Hi, I'm Julia Halperin, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. The year was 1990. Artist Rick Lowe had invited a group of high school students to his studio. Surrounded by his billboard-sized paintings, one of the kids made a comment that stopped him in his tracks. Why was Lowe illustrating problems everyone already knew about rather than proposing creative solutions? That moment changed everything. It pushed Lowe to create art outside the studio and set him on a path to becoming one of the leading figures in an art movement known as social practice. The term social practice describes art that is created with and for communities. Over the past three decades, Lowe has done this in a variety of forms, including his most famous work, Project Row Houses, a hub for community housing and art making in Houston's Third Ward. All the while, Lowe has maintained a painting practice alongside the socially engaged work. He won a MacArthur Genius Grant for all of it in 2014. This month, after a long hiatus from the New York gallery world, he returns with his first solo show of paintings at Gagosian. Artnet News contributor Shade Olagundudu spoke with Lowe as part of a four-part series on Artnet News about artists across generations who work with social practice. Listen to the interview and read the full series on Artnet News. Hi, Rick. Thank you so much for joining us on The Art Angle. I'd love to get started and sort of jump right in with a few questions. You were born in Alabama, studied painting in Georgia, moved to Houston in the 80s, where you lived for many years after attending Texas Southern University. I'm really curious to learn more about your origin story into the art. What are some of the early moments and experiences in your life that you believe led you to pursue an education in the art? There wasn't really a moment. There were things that might have seemed like they would lead that way from early on in maybe middle school, doing social studies projects where they need somebody to draw the maps of the U.S. or the presidents was a big one that we'd have to draw and that kind of stuff. And I could always do that pretty well. I had no context for understanding art in a sense. Mm -hmm. I think maybe sometimes in those magazines, they used to have these like horses that you could draw and win a prize or something. It was something weird like that, but I never did it because I never thought of art as something that I would be connected to. It wasn't until I went to college and I signed up to take an art class because some of the other basketball players and folks in the sports world where I would, thought I would be suggested that I should take an easy class for the first semester and take an art class. And as my energy and my commitment starts shifting away from basketball, it just slowly slipped into art. And so I found myself instead of spending the extra two to three hours at the gym playing basketball and practicing and stuff, I ended up spending those extra two or three hours in the art classroom. And at a certain point during the semester, I enjoyed it so much, you know, and the people were very supportive of what I was doing, which I wasn't at the level of most people because I had no previous training at all. And I think people were taken by the fact that I was so enthusiastic about it. <laughs> at that time, what kind of work were you making? The first class I took was a drawing class. My next studio class was a three-dimensional design class. That was my, I guess, my third semester. It's a very small school. There were only a handful of students that were around the art department. And I became one of those people that was just around. And so then the head painting teacher suggested that I take a class with him, a painting class. The first class, once again, it was still life. But most of the people were taught to paint landscapes. Mm. And so that was my early painting was mostly with landscape painting. That's where I kind of learned my painting skills. Right. And I'm curious to uncover, once you went to Texas Southern University and you decided to stay in Houston, what made you stay? Leaving your home, leaving where you were from, the city where you had grown up, and moving to Texas. 
before Texas, I moved to Biloxi, Mississippi. I mean, I didn't finish school in Columbus, Georgia. I dropped out into my third year. I was encouraged by uh, one of my professors that I was ready to go out into the world and tackle the world because I wasn't a very good student. So I went out into the world and I wanted to go someplace where I knew someone. I had a brother. His wife was stationed there in the Air Force. And I stayed with them a little while. And then I got my own studio there. And that's when I first felt like I was beginning to be an artist. I guess I was there for about a year and a half. My work shift at that point from landscape painting to figurative work, it was all very politically driven and that kind of stuff. So I made the move from Georgia because I wanted to be on my own, developing myself as an artist. I was in Mississippi for about a year, a year and a half. And then I felt like, okay, now after I'd done exhibitions there and little spaces that I was doing, and I thought, okay, I've done the most I could do here. I need to go to a big city. Right. And of course, I had the idea that I should, like every artist, go to New York. You know, that was in the early 80s. And I thought about it and I thought, you know what? No, I'm not such a country boy, small town. Mm-hmm. I had been in New York once. And that's a whole nother crazy story. How I, <laughs> <laughs> it was another crazy. story for another day, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, I knew New York was a big threatening place, you know, and I just thought, oh, I can't do New York. It's too much, you know. So then I thought, okay, more maybe more realistic is maybe Philadelphia or DC. I can't handle cold weather. So that just kind of wiped out the whole Northeast. And then I just thought, okay, what's West? And I thought, California, LA. And that was my goal to go to LA. But then I was like, ah, that's a long way. And then I said, maybe not LA, but I should maybe do Dallas. And in the early 80s, Dallas was like a, it was a more known city than Houston. And I was going to go to Dallas to check it out. A friend of mine that was living in New Orleans, we drove from New Orleans to Houston and got here and we drove around. It was so weird. I mean, it was such a weird place. It's kind of desolate. You know, there were like all these open space places. It had kind of a rawness to it that I, I really could connect to. It felt very Southern in a sense. And even the urban pockets, you know, there were like these areas that were just kind of blown out that felt rural. And so I decided at that moment, I said, you know what? I'm going to move to Houston. And you've been in Houston ever since. Yep. Since 85. Wow. I think that's a perfect time to just switch gears and talk a little bit about Project Row Houses. You know, it's one of your most well-known projects in social engagement. And I'm really curious to sort of hear what are some of the initial ideas that inspired you to start the program and to found it? Because you've done so much with it and it seems to have so many lives and so many legs. Artists can come, people in the community can be impacted by the space. I'm just really curious to uncover that with you. As I said earlier, I was doing figurative painting that dealt with political and social issues. And I was an activist, you know, so I was making paintings But the paintings were just a part of my activism. You know, so I would be out kind of doing things about social justice and against police brutality and all that stuff. A number of my exhibitions at that time were in conjunction with community organizations or part of organizational efforts. So I would do exhibitions for Amnesty International Human Rights Week at the University of Houston. I would do that kind of stuff where I would do installations about police brutality with local community groups. And all that stuff was working fine, I thought, until the infamous moment that I always talk about, this young kid just pulled the rug from under my whole career up that time. 10 years of work just comes in and tells me like, you know, well, while your work shows what's happening in our communities, we don't need that. You know, if artists are creative, why can't they create solutions? And I was like, oh my God, you know, that just kind of shattered things for me. Because up until that point, you had just been making work. Yes, I was making work that was symbolic of things, that was representative of things that were going on. But I never even thought about the fact that, well, maybe your art can be something that is not just representative or symbolic, but it can actually be like a real thing. So after that, I took it as a challenge from this young kid. I closed my studio down and I just start reading and trying to find other artists that have done things that may be a precedent for my thinking about doing something that had a practical application to it. And then I just was doing volunteer work in the community. And I ran across a book 
with Joseph Boyce in it. There's a chapter in it called Social Sculpture, Joseph Boyce term, and he defined it as the way that we shape and mold the world. Mm -hmm. This whole thing about everybody is an artist and we should be thinking of transforming the world as a work of art. It was really interesting for me to read that. And it was the right moment in time because I knew of Joseph Boyce years before, but I never, you know, I wasn't in that moment in space and time to get to his social sculpture concept. And then when I got to that, I just started looking and thinking like, how do you make social sculpture? What does that mean? And it just kind of organically evolved with me doing my activism and trying to be mindful in the community and listening. And one day I was on a tour with a group of activists that were petitioning the city to tear down buildings all over the neighborhood because they were saying they were a nuisance. Abandoned buildings were a nuisance. And uh, I was on that tour bus, you know, I asked if I could go along and they passed these little houses that were a block and a half of 22 little shotgun houses. I mean, as I passed that up and I start thinking about those are beautiful houses. I mean, they're really beautiful. Symbolically, they meant something to me because of me being a Southerner and understanding the kind of shotgun house vernacular. Can you talk to me a little bit about the shotgun house? You know, I'm from New York. I don't know what a shotgun house is. I grew up in a brownstone. So for me, it's like, I'm thinking about a whole different way that people are living. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, it's a very different way of living. And um, I connected with those houses, but I didn't really understand them. I was just captivated by them. And I kept thinking about them and driving by them and stuff. All of a sudden, I started thinking about John Biggers. John Biggers is an African-American artist who moved to Houston in the late 1940s, started an art department at a a local historically Black college here, Texas Southern University. And John Biggers did a lot of paintings with these little shotgun houses in them. And I was fascinated by his painting of them because usually it's not shotgun houses, it's shotgun shacks. You know, shack comes after it. But John Biggers' paintings of them were so majestic. You know, and they were so beautiful and elegant and vibrant. And so I thought, there's got to be something there. I'm going to talk to John Biggers. And so I started to um, talk to John Biggers about the meaning of the shotgun house, you know, and the value. Where did he draw this kind of beauty out of them? You know, some people even connect them to slave quarters. And he was the person that kind of opened my eyes to something different. He said, you know, look, the origin of the so-called shotgun house did not start with slavery in America. You know, the origin of this kind of architecture is rooted in the slave trade from West Africa to the U.S. He had gone there in the 1950s and was surprised as he walked through different communities, villages, and seeing how the architecture felt very Southern to him. He was from North Carolina, you know, and he was like, to West Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was Raleigh, Ghana. He came back and he was like, you know, there's something very familiar about this. And so he's just start researching and all this stuff. He created a kind of a mythology around the shotgun house about how it moved from West Africa through the slave trade, mainly into the West Indies. And then from there into the Southern part of the U.S. through New Orleans, and then from New Orleans throughout. So what struck him though about the architecture was that there was a certain kind of communal element to the layout where you had these little porches and courtyard spaces where people mostly lived. They lived in the outdoors, in the public space. You'd go inside to do your private stuff and what, but you'd spend most of your time outside in the public space where you're working, you're entertaining, you're playing. That was one of the key parts of the shotgun houses at Project Row Houses that was interesting. Originally, there were 30 houses. There were 30 because there was a corresponding house on the back. So it had this courtyard that went down the back. By the time we found them, eight houses had been taken down. The porch in the courtyards, key elements to the shotgun house. And there's so much about the architecture and the design that was really fascinating to me too, as John Biggers was pushing against this notion of Southern architecture. He was laying claim that so much of Southern architecture relies on the knowledge of how to live in warm climates that were brought to the U.S. by people that were taken from the West Coast of Africa. And he talks about, you know, the doors being lined up, not for the purpose of somebody shooting a shotgun through it, but for ventilation purposes, the porch being there as a place that was a shaded place that's cool. And much of that is incorporated in a lot of Southern architecture, all kinds of Southern architecture, even Southern mansions. 
It also seems like as you're describing it, I'm getting this thought that it kind of in a romantic way dials back into project row houses. And this idea that the spaces in which we inhabit and the places in which we live have such a profound effect on our own communities, how we exist in a community, how we feel in that space, and kind of to subvert the idea of what the shotgun house means and you tracing a more deeper, more truer history of its real origin and sort of bringing that to the forefront whether knowingly or unknowingly, whether publicly or privately, that you are sharing that with people in your own way, I think is really beautiful. And I feel like there's a few things that you've said so far that make me feel like certain things that have touched you in your life and have sort of impacted the way that you exist as an artist and as a creator. Absolutely. I think the biggest moment was extremely important for Project Row Houses because I don't think I could have put it together without having a real good conceptual framework. In addition, he truly did give me a sense of what he understood the shotgun houses to mean was a way for me to think about community. He had basically four principles that he said that were relevant in terms of community and that the shotgun houses had an impact on. The first one was, he said, good communities needed to have good and relevant architecture, that the architecture needs to fit the needs of the people that live in them. You know, the architecture with the courtyards, the porches, and allow for people to look after each other's children. And, and then the second thing, he talked about the importance of art. Art is very important to communities. And he talked about how he saw it unfold itself in the shotgun communities of yesteryear, you know, where people would be sitting on the porch, they'd be making their brooms, they'd make their soap. And that's all creative. The just being creative, that's the juice, you know, in the community. Absolutely. Then he talked about education and how people didn't have access to education in the way that we do now. There was incredible informal education. It was more about passing knowledge and wisdom on from one generation to the next. And then the last thing he talked about was the social safety net. There was always a sense of connectedness to each other. I remember once we were talking and he said, people talk about these shotgun houses being too small to live in or whatever, whatever. He says, but I tell you what, I could take you back to a time where you go to a little house like this and people start coming out and they never stop coming out. You know, it'd be 12, 15 people in that little house. Nobody was homeless. There was always a place and said, now you have people that live in 5,000 square feet houses and have relatives that are basically homeless. That sense of connectedness was another part of getting to understand about community. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I kind of, intuitively had that within me, but he was the person that gave me a framework to think about it outside of the personal, not just my own sentiment, but this is a way of thinking about the world. Absolutely. That's so beautiful. We spoke on a previous call and you shared some wonderful insights with me on your reflections of the art world. The most obvious being that there is a great lack of critique around social practice and socially engaged art. Can you share more of your ideas and reflections on the ways the lack of criticism has affected the movement as a whole? For most art, art kind of exists in this world where it has to prove itself or to stand up to the test of time. It has to be able to handle criticism. Criticism in sense of being able to articulate and show a reason and a rationale for your existence. It takes critique to be able to do that. We can all do our work and everybody's doing their work and it's all fine and that kind of stuff. But how does it stand up next to other work? How does it fit within that? I first started to think about that because as a Black person, I mean, I've heard this people saying, well, you know, you can't criticize a Black person that's doing such and such and such kind of work because it's insensitive. But, you know, we have to find ways that we can honestly critique things because everybody wants to be better. I mean, they should want to be better. And critique is a way that you move yourself forward. I fear that the whole notion of social practice being untouchable in terms of critique, it's not going to work for it. It does more harm than good. Yeah, I think it does more harm than good because Well, first of all, a lot of work that should be critiqued and, you know, that may not be as on point as it could be will continue to proliferate. 
And that would become the basis of people saying, oh, well, you know, that worked. It didn't really have any real value, but they were trying to do something good. Right. You know, it's kind of a consolation. As a, an activist, you know, and a person who's trying to do stuff in a community, I'll take that. Yeah, I'm just trying to do something good. But as an artist, I want to be able to say, I'm also doing work in a way that's trying to shape the course of the history of the art world that I came into. It's Western based and I'm practicing in that area. And so I want to be able to have a mark there, make some contribution to it. If there's no critique around it, I don't think that's going to happen. I thought that was such a powerful point. And I definitely wanted to ask you about it again, because in thinking about what you're saying, it's almost like the rigor and the intensity and the attention to detail that would allow an artist to get better. If nobody is critiquing the work, if no one has the language to talk about or track what the work has done. And I think with social practices, the way it would need to be critiqued are probably very, very different than a painting. It takes a certain level of understanding about the world and statistics and how people's lives have changed. It's a very different way of thinking about what is art doing or of mapping progress or mapping success. Absolutely. In fact, you bring up a very good point there, too, about how is it critiqued? That's a big question. How is it critiqued? Social practice work and social and community engaged work is so complex. It's not a simple thing, you know, and I think because maybe we're in the early stages of this as a practice, we're kind of clumsy. You know, we don't really know what to do. And, you know, we don't know how to talk about it. We don't know how to critique. And all that stuff, I think, needs to be taken in consideration that we don't necessarily know how at this point. But I think we owe it to ourselves as artists to allow critique and encourage it and embrace it. And for those who think and write about the work for them to be actively trying to figure out how to do it in the best way. Absolutely. Absolutely. In a recent conversation with Thelma Golden and Sir David Ajay on the eve of Antoine Sargent's first social works exhibition at Gagosian, Thelma mentioned the idea of mapping in your work. Can you speak more specifically about mapping, the importance of geographical locations, and the ways in which site-specific work uncovers hidden histories in Black American life? Well, I'm very fascinated with the idea of physical mapping, but also social mapping, psychological mapping, all these kinds of things, you know, the patterns that we make from our daily lives of just kind of repeating things. And what's interesting about it to me is that most of the time we're making patterns that we don't even recognize. You're in New York City, if you work at a particular place or you shop at a certain grocery store or whatever, if you could take your trip to the grocery store for six months or a year and you map it, you'd start to see like, oh, sometimes you didn't go straight to the grocery store. Sometimes you wandered off. Sometimes you came back. And those things are very interesting. They tell you a lot, but they also leave you with a lot of mystery. I'm interested in the mystery of mapping. Like what does it say, but what does it not say? Yes, yes, absolutely. Over the last, what, nearly 30 years of doing social practice work and trying to understand community and how they move and with mass movement of gentrification all over the world, you know, what does all this stuff mean? We have all that information, but there's so much we still don't know. We may know it, but we still don't know how to solve it. Maybe you say, well, the problem with gentrification and these kinds of things, basically it's a moral issue. People who are into land development will say, you know, well, it's the natural forces of economics that you want to invest in this way, in this property, as opposed to in that way, in this property, whatever. Yeah, I mean, there are some people that say that, but then there are other people would say, well, no, but it's a choice. What are the ethics behind the choices that we're making that forces along the kinds of patterns of activity that we have in terms of physical life for people? You know, whether it's rural communities giving way to encroachment of urban kind of spaces or, you know, like where I'm from down South, it's even like subsidies for farming and stuff. What happens when certain subsidies stop or what happens when certain subsidies are supported over others and how it forces people to move, it forces the land to change. There's so many things about the process of life that happens through patterns. It's just fascinating to me. And I get to ask these questions as I make paintings. And in my own head, I will make up my own answers and then dispel my own answers. And it's just a constant, you know, as people say, history repeats itself because we're like moving ourselves through the patterns of life. 
Absolutely. On the one hand, with social practice, you have the visual component of art making. And on the other hand, it seems that you have the sort of real world application of how to solve problems that people have in the communities that they live in, exist in, et cetera. In your opinion, how do those two things work together? Or do they? That's a very, very, very good question. And I think that's one of the challenges of social practice. And that's why critique is important. What is the relationship between the practical aspects that we desire to do that may not necessarily be something that you want to make the responsibility of art, but art can also be attached to your effort to try to do that. And so it's a tough place because this whole idea of art creating solutions, which that was the challenge that I had many years ago, and I had to kind of rethink that to think, should I be held to the responsibility of creating a solution for housing shortage as an artist? Or the other side of it too, is like, you know, artists, we're all pretty self-indulgent, you know, and it's just like an ego thing that we think, oh yeah, we can do it. You know, the rest of the world, society can't do it. And I think that was part of Joseph Boy's rooted in his idea of social sculpture too, right? There was a sense that religion has failed as, as a way of organizing society in a way to reach its highest self. And politics had failed in its ability to do that, you know, and just kind of thinking about all the systems that we've used to try to figure out how to make the human habitation of this place something that is at a higher level. So Joseph Boyd is like, well, maybe art has to do that. Art will be the thing that could do it. It's a bit grandiose because also, you know, when you get into that world, particularly now, because you get the idealism of artists creating solutions mess with hyper-capitalism. It's like, hey, if you want to do something, then how does it measure up in an economic sense? <laughs> you know, all of a sudden social practice and community engaged art has been scrutinized in this way of like, how do you measure it? What are the matrix and that kind of stuff? And there are matrix and measurements, but you know, it's like you can't measure an artist that's working on a project about feeding homeless people against, you know, an organization like solve world hunger. The amount of resources that are invested, it's a different kind of thing. We have to figure out how to evaluate it. We need a language or a system needs to be developed in which to talk about it first. You know, that has to happen before we can actually have the conversation because it's like, what are we using as our toolbox to kind of understand what we're doing? And that's why I said, I think that we're very early in the social practice, maybe in 20, 30 years from now, if social practice survives, you know, it would have resolved some of those issues. I think it's beautiful to hear you say that if it has survived, because I think there are so many young artists today who are really inspired by your work and are thinking about living differently. They're thinking about existing in this world differently, especially people who are makers, who are artists and actively creating, actively on a daily basis, thinking about the way we live. The conversation extends to artists who come from a different generation who learned about you and read about you in college or through friends or through their own communities, their own networks, and were super inspired by what you did with Project Row Houses and took that inspiration and ran with it and are now engaging in their own practices. And so I think the spirit of the work that you've already done will live on. That's kind of part of the nature of art. It has this meaning and this value that you can't really know. You know, you can't really know that when someone walked in and saw like a painting by somebody or a sculpture by somebody, you can't check a box when they walk away from it and say, okay, so this changed their life in this way, but whatever. But it may be a situation that 20, 30 years later, you'd find somebody who's found a whole new path of their life based on that. I do want to circle back to something that you said earlier on about being an activist. And I'm thinking about a situation in which you're confronted with this young high school, you know, it's a young mind living in the community that you're living in, living through the stuff that you may be experiencing too, but coming to it from a different lens and impressing on your mind something new. It's a breakthrough moment. That's what you have just described when you shared that. And so I wanted to go back and ask you, what drew you to activism? Most People that knew me when I was growing up as a, particularly by the time I made it to high school, I mean, folks thought that I was going to be probably a preacher. 
irreverent. I mean, not because of, you know, religious stuff, but basically because in the South, most of the people that were involved in standing up for things and doing things right were reverends. Reverend Martin Luther King, you know, Reverend Jesse Jackson. And so if there was somebody that was standing up, they were probably going to be a reverend. You know, that was the idea. I had no desire to be a reverend, but, but I did have a sense that like if things weren't right, I should say something. I felt a sense of calm when I could say something. And so I think the early days I was had this sense that I would probably do some kind of activism. So that was just a part of me. Becoming an artist was another way for me to find myself and define myself as an activist. Right. I love that. With your forthcoming show, Akagosian, can you talk to me about some of the works in the show and the things that you're working on in that exhibition? Most of my work is untitled. I don't really work with titles because I don't necessarily have specific things that I'm trying to illustrate other than just my fascination with this notion of patterns and color and how it speaks to us. But there are a couple of things that this have a focus. I've started to think about how painting could be a way of me archiving some of the community-based projects that I've been working on over time, because that's one of the challenges of social practice work is it's ephemeral. Project Row House has been around getting close to 30 years, which that's great, but most projects don't make it that far. And even if projects continue for decades, at some point they kind of morph out of being a project and become more of an institution kind of thing, which is great, you know? And so how do you capture those moments of what it means as an art project? And so I started to think about painting in that way. And so I have a couple of paintings that are project row houses related. I also have a project that's happening in Athens, Greece called Victoria Square Project. And there'll be a couple of paintings that deals with that. Now, when I say paintings that those are titled under these kind of specific projects doesn't mean that I'm trying to give a graphic depiction of them. It's just an interpretive sense of my feelings, how I would see it in color and in shape and in in the way that I layer these patterns and that kind of stuff. Some of it, there's some collage stuff, images that are mixed in and, but very subtle, you know, not to be overt by any means. And for the rest of the work, it's a combination of things that I'm doing that are trying to find the language to talk about social practice. I mean, it's, you know, some of the works I like to think of them as almost has a little bit of a hieroglyphic, like, and that's my way of playing around with this idea of how we see things and we read things, but there's so much more there that we don't understand. The magic and the mystery. The magic, there it is. Yeah, absolutely. The magic and the mystery behind all these words that we're constantly getting to know. And I think the mysteries are the interesting places too, right? I mean, we know what we know and that's fine, but it's what we don't know that's really interesting. How do we get to work ourselves through that? Couldn't agree more. Your practice and what you've done over the course of your lifetime thus far, and as an artist, is it 30 years, 40 years? 40 years as an artist, yeah, for sure, yeah. You know, your practice has become critical to our broader understanding of social practice as a movement. In your opinion, has the movement, if one will call it that, has it achieved the goals that it initially set out to, like in your mind? I have my moments where I just think, you know, what in the world? You know, does any of this stuff have any meaning? Does it have any real value? I'll, you know, allow myself to be a little down about it and I'll mope about it and think, oh, I don't social practice, whatever. And then one day I was going around in my studio. I I had to pull something from my archive and I saw this book in one of the boxes of philosophy books that I have. And there was a book sitting on the top, a book by a Roman philosopher named Boethius. And I remember reading this book like 30 years ago. The book is called The Constellation of Philosophy. And I was thinking, if I remember correctly, that book was really interesting. Let me just go back because there's something that hit me about it. And it hit me that it was something relevant to what I'm feeling now. I kind of remembered it was about him questioning the value of philosophy. And I went back and I reread it and and I'll say, oh my God, yeah, here it is. Boethius translated apparently a lot of Aristotle and Plato's work, loved philosophy, but he also understood Aristotle's thing about philosophy should not just be a theoretical thing. It should be put into practice. And so Boethius became a part of the Roman Senate. And so he was like living 
out the dream of living up to philosophy. And then he was actually accused of undermining the Senate and sentenced to death. And so apparently he wrote this book as he was waiting to be executed. As I said, the book is called The Constellation of Philosophy. And it starts out with him basically pining about why was he in this situation? He was complaining to philosophy. You know, he's like, dear philosophy, why am I here? I did everything you asked me to do. I sought the truth. I applied ethics. I put it in practice by becoming a politician. And look, here I am. I'm sitting here waiting to be, you know, put to death. And as he's putting forth his complaint, this character comes down from above that is called Lady Philosophy, who comes down to console him, to help him clear his thoughts and understand that whether you have good fortune or bad fortune, that's not the role of philosophy. Philosophy is about truth. And I was just thinking, oh my God, I mean, I'm not being executed, thank God, but I'm having a similar thing. You know, I'm like, social practice, where are we? You know, I mean, I've given you so much and I've tried to do everything. Is anything happening here? So yeah, I have those deep questions. So then I just popped up with this idea of something that I felt like I needed to do. And I contacted a friend of mine, Tom Finkel Pearl, who's the author in New York, and he's written a couple of books that Project Or Has has been a part of. And I told him this story. I wrote it out for him. I sent him an email and told him I wanted to do a book that was called The Constellation of Social Practice as a parallel to Boethius to talk about all the disappointments of social practice, but do it in a way in which there are other voices that come into the process to reassure me, to help me understand the value and what we're all doing here. And we're working on that little project now. That was Boethius' intent too, right? I mean, he was criticizing philosophy, but really his criticism of it was only to be able to give it a platform for people to understand its real value. Hmm. That's very interesting. It also sounds like there's been so much that has really impressed upon your mind, upon your consciousness, this reading and this research and the internal sort of dialogue of what am I doing? What is my purpose? Why is it important? How is it important? How does it function? I think what I'm pulling is that there is so much questioning. It's a questioning of the world. It's a questioning of oneself. It's a questioning of the things that you see around yourself. And in that questioning, The next part is, well, how do I find solutions to the things that I see around me that aren't right? Going back to that reverend, going back to that sort of being a stand-up person, a leader, being stand-up in your community. That's one of the reasons that I value critique is that it helps us get to the questions about what do we not know? What are we missing? Where are there gaps and opportunities? Right, right. Final question of the episode. As you look to the future, what are you most excited about in your work and in your life in general? I'm most excited about participating with younger artists and be a part of the energy that they apply to continuing the work that I've done, that I'm building. I'm a continuation of other artists' work and seeing how that plays out. I'm looking at the next generation. Our society has been challenged in a lot of ways. It's been crippled a bit by this kind of movement away from the notion of kind of social movements and those kinds of things. I mean, it's moved into much more me. I don't know what will happen and what it will take to kind of make a shift, but I know that as a species, we are definitely stronger together. That is how we move best when we're together. But we've been moving apart for the past 40 years or so. And I think that art can play a big role in that in helping us kind of find our way back into this part of what I think our nature really is, being social beings. Because I think it's where and when we could be most social is when we're capable of addressing the challenges that we have. And I say that I'm looking forward to young people doing that because the answer is kind of seated in them. Because They're going to have to fight their way out of this kind of me world that they've inherited. You know, whereas many of us that are coming from the we world, the social world, we're still holding on to the old notions of how we came together, you know, in protests and in this and that, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it's not moving us right now the old way. And so I'm looking forward to how the new folks will teach us or teach themselves. And hopefully I get a chance to see some of that in my lifetime. Yes, 
Absolutely. I think that's such a beautiful note to end the episode on and such a high note to sort of think about the next generation and, you know, what the future can be and what it can look like. Well, Rick, it's been a pleasure speaking with you and thank you so much for your time. I'm so excited to see your show at Gagosian and also so excited to see how you continue to grow and how the movement grows itself. Very good. Well, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) That's it for this week's episode. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili, Caroline Goldstein, and Tim Schneider. Thanks for listening. See you next week.